Hello, welcome to today's webinar which will be focused on AC susceptibility measurements using the ACMS2 measurement option for the PPMS, Dynacool, and Versalab. The ACMS2 replaces the legacy ACMS option which was only compatible with the PPMS platform. This webinar will start with a discussion of the basic theory behind AC susceptibility measurements. We will then discuss how to install the ACMS2 option and then move on to sample mounting considerations. Finally, sequence writing and data analysis will be discussed. Firstly, some basic theory and motivation as to why AC susceptibility measurements are useful. I'd like to first draw your attention to an application note written some time ago devoted solely to AC susceptibility measurements. It can be found on the applications page under application notes and contains much of what I'll discuss in the following slides. Before discussing an AC susceptibility measurement, let's quickly review DC magnetometry using the Vibrating Sample Magnetometer, or VSM. For a VSM measurement, the sample vibrates within a first-order gradiometer, and the induced voltage is measured using a lock-in amplifier. The magnitude of the in-phase component of the induced voltage is then, via calibration constants, used to determine the DC magnetic moment. Here are several schematic examples of the DC magnetic moment as a function of applied magnetic field. For a DC measurement, we are only measuring the magnitude of the moment vector at a particular temperature and applied magnetic field. While we can measure while sweeping the applied field, we are generally not sensitive to any time-dependent phenomena for most samples as our magnetic field ramp rates are typically quite slow. This is in stark contrast to an AC susceptibility measurement in which we are explicitly interested in the time-dependent variations of the magnetic moment or magnetization generated by an AC magnetic field of a given amplitude and frequency. The resulting AC moment can be parameterized by a phase with respect to the AC drive field and is reported in units of degrees. The amplitude of the AC moment is typically reported in EMU and is often divided by the amplitude of the AC drive field. The amplitude and phase of the AC moment can be represented as a phasor in the complex plane, from which the real component, chi prime, and imaginary component, chi double prime, can be calculated using these well-known trigonometric relations. One can interpret the real components as corresponding to the in-phase response of the magnetic moment, relative to the AC drive field, of course and the imaginary component as the quadrature or out of phase response. The imaginary component is typically related to damping and energy loss mechanisms within the sample. Note, the ACMS2 actually directly measures the real and imaginary components from which the amplitude and phase are then calculated. AC susceptibility measurements can prove useful for a wide variety of samples. For example, the temperature dependence of a spin glass exhibits a sharp cusp indicating the freezing temperature. Furthermore, the frequency dependence of this cusp can be used to further study the various damping mechanisms and interactions at play. Similarly, superparamagnetic samples are also often studied using an AC susceptometer where the blocking temperature is a critical material property. Finally, Superconducting samples show clear features in an AC susceptibility measurement. Focusing just on curve number one, we see that the chi prime or in phase response as a function of temperature clearly indicates the expected diamagnetic response of the sample when in the superconducting state. As the temperature is increased, the superconducting transition temperature is clearly observed, and the peak in the chi double prime or out of phase response can be used to study the various damping mechanisms at play, for example, superconducting vortex motion. More details regarding these measurements can be found in the aforementioned application note. Measurements is a function of applied DC magnetic field, and as I show here, AC drive frequency are also possible using the ACMS2. Such frequency dependent measurements are commonly performed on single molecule magnets. For more information, see the cited paper. Such frequency dependent measurements are also useful when studying magnetic nanoparticles and can be used to calculate the average nanoparticle size and relaxation mechanism. How are AC susceptibility measurements actually performed? The heart of the ACMS2 is the coil set. Compared to the VSM coil set, 
the ACMS2 coil set requires many more components. Firstly, the ACMS2 coil set has an 8mm diameter bore, meaning our standard 6mm diameter straws can be used as sample holders. AC measurements require four distinct coils, each with a specific function. The drive coil, shown in yellow, provides the necessary AC drive field with frequencies spanning 10 to 10,000 Hz and amplitudes as large as 15 Ørsted. The drive coil is long in order to provide as uniform of an excitation as possible. Not explicitly shown is the counterwound compensation coil which resides outside of the AC drive coil and is wound in series with it. The compensation coil minimizes the AC drive field outside of the coil set to minimize interactions with the nearby sample chamber. The detection coil, shown in red, measure the AC moment of the sample and are wound in a conventional first order gradiometer arrangement, similar to the detection coils used for the VSM. The trim coils, shown in blue, allow for the system to efficiently null the signal to remove as much of the temperature and magnetic field dependent background contribution as possible. The two single turn low inductance calibration coils are connected in series and are situated at the center of each detection coil. The calibration coils simulate a sample with an entirely real response and therefore allow the system to correct for instrument dependent variations in the phase and amplitude, thus improving measurement accuracy. Within the ACMS2 coil set is a Cernox thermometer, which is critical for accurate sample thermometry. Note that the ACMS2 coil set uses all 12 of the available sample chamber wiring connections. The felt helps ensure the coil set is properly centered within the sample chamber and only weakly coupled to it. For completeness, the coil set serial number will be indicated at the bottom of the puck. Finally, the necessary electronics needed to energize the drive and trim coils as well as the lock-in amplifier needed to measure the AC voltages generated in the detection and calibration coils resides within the ACMS2 module. This module also includes the bridge card necessary to read the coil set thermometer. The procedure for an accurate AC susceptibility measurement is far more involved as compared to a DC measurement using, for example, the VSM option. There are one, three, and five point measurement modes each providing differing levels of accuracy and applicable in different measurement scenarios. Here I will go through, step by step, the three-point measurement protocol, which we generally consider the default measurement mode. Firstly, the sample is centered between the detection coils, as shown here. Under perfect conditions, we would expect zero signal from the sample. This is, however, never going to be completely true, and the signal must be further trimmed. With the drive coil energized at the frequency and amplitude requested by the user, the amplitude and relative phase of the trim coil excitation are tuned to further minimize or null any residual background signal within the detection coils. After the signal is properly nulled, the three-point measurement procedure can begin, with the sample now placed at the center of the bottom detection coil as shown. At this location, the measured signal will include any residual background left after nulling, plus the AC signal of the sample. The measurement then continues by placing the sample at the center of the top detection coil, where the measured signal will again include any residual background signal minus the AC signal of the sample. The sample is once again placed at the center of the bottom detection coil, where the signal is measured one more time. With the sample still at the center of the bottom detection coil, the signal from the calibration coil is then included in series. The measured signal now includes the residual background and the AC response of the sample, as before, plus two additional terms. The first is proportional to the AC response of the sample where the calibration coil effectively adds a single turn to the detection coil, so a small factor K must be included. The second additional term is simply due to the induced signal in the calibration coil due to the AC drive field. One more measurement with the sample at the bottom location is then performed where the polarity of the calibration coil has been reversed. Therefore, a three-point measurement, which includes three locations within the coil set, actually requires five distinct measurements. From these five measurements, the sample signal and calibration coil signals can be calculated as follows. The raw AC response of the sample is then simply calculated by taking the ratio of the two. 
Additional calibration factors are then applied to arrive at the measured in and out of phase components to the susceptibility. As mentioned earlier, the amplitude and phase can then be calculated as shown. As previously mentioned, one can perform a 1, 3, or 5 point measurement to determine the AC susceptibility. This table summarizes the differences between these modes. The one point mode simply keeps the sample located at the center of the bottom detection coil during the course of a measurement. This mode results in the fastest but least accurate measurement of the susceptibility. The one point mode is good for quickly measuring the qualitative response of a given sample, for example, hunting down an unknown superconducting transition temperature of a novel sample. However, once the region of interest has been found, we would recommend using the three-point measurement mode, as described prior, for more accurate results. The three-point mode removes a linear drift of the sample moment during the course of the measurement. Note, the three-point measurement mode should be used at a stable temperature, as it is not able to remove linear drift of the background signal. In order to remove a linear drift of the background, the five-point measurement mode should be used which includes two additional measurements with the sample centered between the detection coils. This allows the experimenter to slowly sweep the temperature during the course of the measurement. Note, given the relatively large thermal mass of the ACMS2 coil set, the temperature should be swept very slowly. We usually recommend keeping the ramp rates well below 1 Kelvin per minute. A few comments on the measured quantities and the unit system employed by the ACMS2. Strictly speaking, the ACMS2 does not report the volume susceptibility as it is commonly defined in most textbooks. The ACMS2, much like the VSM option, measures the extrinsic quantity moment, and therefore the Latin character capital X should be used, and we colloquially refer to this value as the susceptibility. The conventional definition of the volume susceptibility, which uses the Greek symbol chi, relies on the intrinsic quantity magnetization. One can therefore calculate the volume susceptibility, as usually defined, by simply dividing the value reported by the ACMS2 option by the sample volume. As a precise measure of the sample volume is often impractical, it is more convenient to define the mass susceptibility as follows, which can be calculated by dividing by the sample density or mass. The ACMS2 is also able to measure the standard DC moment, and is virtually identical in functionality to the PPMS VSM option. Namely, the sample vibrates between the detection coils. The resulting sensitivity is between that of the VSM regular and large bore coil sets, about 5 micro EMU. On to installing the ACMS2 option. The first step is to install the ACMS2 hardware. To do so, make sure the sample chamber is at room temperature vented, and at zero field. Then install the ACMS2 coil set using the puck insertion tool. After the coil set is installed, the guide tube is then inserted. This is then followed by carefully placing the linear transport motor into place and finally clamping it. After the motor is in place, ensure it is connected to the motor module. Then connect the ACMS2 module to the gray limo connection. Note, the ACMS2 module also includes two BNC connections, which can be used to optionally monitor the pickup coil and AC drive signals using an external oscilloscope. Activation of the ACMS2 software follows as it does with any software option namely by clicking Utilities in the menu bar, followed by Activate Option, and selecting the ACMS2 option. During the activation process, the ACMS2 coil set configuration file is loaded and read. The motor is homed and the coil set thermometry is established. For the Dynacool system, the temperature indicator will turn blue when controlling off of the ACMS2 coil set. Moving on to sample mounting. Instead of repeating everything that was previously mentioned, 
I will simply refer you to the sample mounting guidelines within the PPMS VSM webinar, where the two most important things to remember are keep the samples small, generally less than 4 millimeters in any given dimension is recommended. Also minimize impurities within the sample and sample holder. There are two notable exceptions, however. Firstly, samples are now mounted 25 millimeters from the bottom of the sample holder. While the sample mounting stations look very similar between the VSM and ACMS2, they are in fact different. Secondly, and most importantly, use insulating sample holders, such as the quartz paddle or drinking straws. The AC magnetic fields necessary for an AC susceptibility measurement will induce eddy currents within electrically conducting sample holders, which will affect the accuracy of the results. The ACMS2 allows for the sample to be centered using a scanning AC or DC measurement. For AC centering, the default AC drive parameters are typically sufficient. With the AC drive energized, the sample is then simply translated through the coil set. The location in which the measured response passes through zero defines the sample location. Note, for many samples, a DC field is not needed to generate a measurable AC moment. For the DC centering technique, which is identical to that used by the PPMS VSM, the sample vibrates and translates through the gradiometer. Here the maximum value corresponds to the sample center location. Note, it is quite common to use a DC field to magnetize the sample in order to ensure there is a measurable moment for DC centering. The green fit curve should closely approximate the measured black data points for each technique and the calculated center position should correspond to the location of the sample on the holder, namely 25 millimeters. If both AC and DC centering techniques are not providing enough signal to center, then feel free to enter the offset manually, ideally at the suggested 25 millimeter position. The final portion of this webinar will be focused on sequence writing and data analysis. Here are the sequence commands available with the ACMS2 option activated. Note, unlike for the VSM option, there are no preset moment versus field or moment versus temperature sequence commands. Instead, one must build these loop sequences using the scan temperature or scan field system commands, as I show here. The most often used sequence command will of course be the AC susceptibility command. Double clicking on it will open this window. Here I would like to highlight the three options the experimenter has for setting the averaging time. One can set the total time or the number of cycles to be averaged. For measurements at a fixed frequency, it is the experimenter's personal choice which option they would like to use. For example, if the measurement frequency was 100 Hz, either averaging for one second or 100 cycles would yield the same total measurement time. However, if the measurement frequency was only 10 Hz, then a one second averaging time would only average over 10 cycles which may not be sufficient depending on the signal size of the sample. Additionally, if measurements are being performed over a broad range of frequencies, we suggest using the third option, that is to average for the longest amount of time. For example, with the parameters shown here, a measurement at 10 Hz would use the cycles criteria and the measurement would take 10 seconds. However, a measurement at 10 kHz would use the time criteria and average for only one second, but average over 10,000 cycles. Using this option allows one to better balance the total measurement time when measuring over a range of frequencies. Also remember, many measurements are performed using the 3 or 5 point measurement protocol, and the ultimate measurement time will scale accordingly. The excitation tab contains a lot of measurement parameters, the most critical being of course the AC drive amplitude and frequency. If one would like to measure over several amplitudes and or frequencies, these values can be entered here as well and separated with a comma, as shown. The order radio button allows the experimenter to choose which parameter takes precedence during the measurement sequence. For example, by clicking on the view sequence button, one can see that measurements are performed at a given amplitude and then each frequency is measured before moving on to the next amplitude. Similarly, if frequency is chosen, then the measurements proceed as shown. At temperatures at or below 10 Kelvin, the field and necessary currents generated by the AC drive coil can cause warming. Furthermore, the degree of heating is strongly dependent on the drive frequency. This table shows the maximum drive fields as a function of temperature and frequency one should use to avoid such heating. 
One can more conveniently populate the amplitude and or frequency parameters by clicking here, which will bring up one of these dialog boxes. For most measurements, we suggest using the three-point measurement mode. Remember, if measuring is a function of temperature, it is important to stabilize at each temperature as the three-point mode is not able to account for a temperature-dependent drift of the background signal. If you choose to sweep temperature, then use the five-point measurement mode. Auto-nulling will initiate a nulling operation every time a different excitation frequency is used. We recommend using auto-nulling and auto-ranging. The centering tab is identical to that used for the VSM option. For measurements performed as a function of temperature, we recommend to always have touchdown centering enabled. The default parameters shown are usually sufficient. As the temperature is varied, the sample chamber will thermally expand and contract, and therefore the relative position of the sample to the center of the coil set will also change. During a touchdown operation, the measurement is temporarily stopped and the sample holder is moved down until it touches the bottom of the coil set, thus directly probing the amount of thermal expansion or contraction, allowing for the new center position to be calculated. Measurements of the DC moment are also possible using the ACMS2, and as mentioned before, are carried out just as they are for the VSM option. I'll refer the listener to the webinar devoted to the VSM option for more details. Now for a couple of quick examples of data generated using the ACMS2 option. Here's a temperature dependent measurement using a DC field of 1.5 Tesla of a niobium titanium superconductor. The AC drive field was fixed at about 1 kHz at an amplitude of 5 Ersten. The plate light sample was simply glued to a quartz paddle using GE varnish. I plotted the real and imaginary components along with the amplitude and phase. This measurement was performed upon warming. Initially, the sample is in the superconducting phase, showing clear signatures of a strong diamagnetic response. More specifically, a relatively large negative value of the real component and a 180 degree phase shift. As the temperatures increase, the sample returns to the normal phase indicated by a very weak paramagnetic response. Note that the phase is not zero as the sample is still electrically conductive above its superconducting transition temperature. The phase is also a little bit noisy as it is derived from the real and imaginary components, which are both marginally above the noise floor. The second data set is of a molecular magnet sample measured at 50 Kelvin and at zero DC field. The AC drive field was fixed at an amplitude of 4 Ørsted and the frequency was increased over the available range offered by the ACMS2. This particular sample was highly air sensitive and was therefore sealed in a quartz ampule within a glove box and then mounted inside of a clear drinking straw. I have only plotted the real and imaginary components as a function of the AC drive frequency as it is usually done for these types of samples. Note the curves are best viewed using a log spacing along the x-axis. Before wrapping up, let's summarize some of the key specifications for the ACMS2. The ACMS2 works over the entire temperature range of the specific base system being used. For the Dynacool, this would be 1.8 to 400 Kelvin. Note, there is no oven capability for the ACMS2 as there is for the VSM option. This is because the ACMS2 coil set cannot function properly in high vacuum, a requirement for the oven option. The AC drive amplitude can vary between 0.05 and 15 Ørsted with a frequency spanning 10 to 10,000 Hz. The sensitivity of the ACMS2 is about 1 times 10 to the minus 8 EMU at 10,000 Hz. Note, one should expect an order of magnitude decrease in the sensitivity for every order of magnitude decrease in the drive frequency. The phase resolution is also plus minus 0.5 degrees. And finally, those choosing to perform DC moment measurements can expect the sensitivity on the order of 5 micro EMU. In addition to this webinar, there are many other resources available. Specific to the ACMS2 option are the manual and aforementioned application note. As there is a lot of crossover between the ACMS2 option and the VSM option, I encourage you to also utilize the VSM webinar and sample mounting application note. All of these resources can be found on the applications page of the QDUSA.com website. I would like to remind you all of our digital online database, Pharos, which contains a wealth of detailed information regarding our measurement platforms and options, including example sequences, application seminars, and the application notes mentioned in this webinar. If you don't already have a Pharos account, 
current Quantum Design customers can sign up for one at the website indicated. If you have any further questions, do not hesitate to reach out. If you have questions related to pricing, lead times, etc., then please forward your request to our sales department. If you have questions related to hardware, repairs, or installations, this request is best sent to our service department. And finally, any questions related to measurements, sample preparation, research, and of course this webinar should be sent to our applications department. Thank you very much for your attention.